Hey there, <clears throat> welcome back, hello. Um, good to be with you for our next and most current installment of uh, Ethics. We're down to just the last few uh, lecture pieces of our term. So this is uh, number 21, if uh, I'm keeping tally. And uh, this is actually gonna be our last meeting on the topic of the animal ethics issue. So we'll be moving on from that and uh, just having a brief discussion to follow two little lessons on um, the question of whether we have uh, any moral obligations to assist the third world poor uh, living in absolute poverty or do we not have that moral obligation. So that'll be our topic uh, to round out the later part of this week. I'll post those lectures uh, in the next few days. One will be from Peter Singer, uh, who, as we know, is a, a player in the animal ethics arena. Uh, he wrote All Animals Are Equal in the book Animal Liberation. And so he's one of our authors um, that we've already reviewed. But he's back and he's going to have one lesson for us, one essay that uh, is in our book about uh, the question of whether we have obligations to the absolute poor, which he does think we have obligations to them. On the other hand, we'll also study the author Garrett Hardin, who says to the contrary that we don't have moral obligations to assist the third world poor. And he doesn't even actually think that it's um, beneficial for all sides involved in the long run. It, but that's part of the argument he gives. And we'll compare those two last authors. And then next week, it's all about uh, two things, just getting those essays in and then also taking your final exam. But now you have all the material you need. We've posted the uh, midterm, sorry, final exam study guide and the prompts for those essays are out. So I hope you're working on them and um, doing your best following the lecture series. Uh, again, we just have a couple more now to go as we wrap things up. So today we are, again, um, closing our course chapter on, um, or the course unit on uh, animal ethics. And uh, we reviewed uh, a number of interesting different views. Um, we began by just surveying the territory of this topic and looking at its general, um, you know, moral controversies on either side. Those that say animals are mistreated or that they have rights um, or that the use of them in factory farming or for animal agriculture, meat, animal experiments, that that's morally impermissible. Other people saying that there's nothing impermissible about that. And largely these arguments revolve around the moral status of the animals. Some saying that because they can feel pleasure and pain, that their pleasure and pain should be weighed equally to ours and considered in utilitarian style reasoning about how to act toward them. Uh, others saying that on a more deontological basis, that they're lacking in certain distinctive uh, rational capacities, whether that's self-awareness or legislation of the moral law, um, you know, something's missing rationally, language could be a number of ways of expressing it, but some people say that debars them from members of the moral community and they may be therefore used as a means. Uh, Immanuel Kant definitely said something like that in his last, uh, well, last few lectures ago where we talked about his view that we only have indirect duties to animals. Since they're not rational, they may be used as a means, but he thinks that the use of animals should at least be something significant in terms of the uh, utility to humans cruelty for sport he doesn't think should be indulged in even if we have no direct duties to them indirectly speaking if we were to be too cruel to the animals we would probably ultimately end up hurting humans too and that's where he thinks that it would become a, a violation of a direct duty to them so indirect duty towards uh mankind is the reason that we should try to practice kindness toward animals but that was Kant. um there was also cohen kind of following in some of Kant's footsteps saying that animals can't uh, make moral claims and that's a rational ability that they don't have. So in that way, he says that they may be used um, for our purposes. They don't have rights to be treated better than that uh, because in order to have rights, he thinks that you'd again have to be an individual that is capable of making moral claims or responding to them. Uh, beyond that, he does think also that the total net <clears throat> utility generated by use of animals in biomedical experiments surpasses um, the total utility minus pain that would be created in the alternative scenario where we didn't use these animals because of the, his estimation of how uh, massively valuable all the results of such experiments have been. And then last time we uh, also added to our, you know, um, knowledge on the topic by looking at the writing of Tom Regan. So Tom Regan, another author, he argues <clears throat> even more perhaps progressively than Peter Singer that animals are not just uh, beings capable of pleasure and pain and thus their pleasure and pain should be weighed equally to ours. Beyond this, he says they actually have rights. Uh, they should have rights where applicable that are of equal measure, equal strength to our own. 
including rights to life, rights to liberty, um, and other things of those kinds, right to be free of pain and suffering. Um, well, why does he think they have rights? He doesn't believe that it has to do with the possession of any kind of reasonable, uh, rational criteria or higher cognitive abilities. He just thinks it's being the subject of a life, which is essentially being a conscious being that can feel things, sense things, perceive things, and has some self-interest and a subjective point of view. Um, so you and I and other living things are also subjects of a life in the way he defines the term, and that's why he thinks any such thing should be shown those rights, and therefore uh, he believes that we should radically not just uh, you know tamp it down or uh, move it over to like more sustainably or more humanely produced animal products, but rather he thinks that there's the right solution would be radically to boycott and abolish all those institutions. He says that you can't um, fix or repair an unjust, a fundamentally unjust institution by simply tidying it up or trying to reform it. It has to be eliminated. Uh, that's why he, for example, says that we got rid of things like slavery or segregation. Um, and in the same way, he thinks that in the perfect moral universe, we wouldn't be using animals for food, for hunting, for sport, or for um, uh, experiments of any kind. Um, so as a quick test of his intuitions about the proper treatment of animals, he says, if something would be wrong to do to a human, then he thinks it would be wrong to do it to an animal too. Now, um, he also considers a range of objections to the idea that animals have rights, and he tried to rebut the various points. One objection might be that, um, well, we only have indirect duties to them, like what Kant had said. But we should think of them only as having value, uh, maybe insofar as they can be extensions of a human being's interests. Um, but Regan disagrees with that. He says, how can you compare uh, something that really only has indirect value, like someone's car? It's valuable, but only insofar as it is uh, the possession of another person, so you don't just destroy it or harm it, uh, but out of indirectly speaking, the recognition of the rights of the uh, owner of the car. But you could say, according to Regan, how is a car or something that's a person's property like that, how can that be compared to the situation of an animal, which is a living thing that is sentient, that can feel? Um, so he doesn't see why they shouldn't be the direct objects of moral concern for those different reasons. Um, after that, he considers another opposition, which is contractarianism. Some people say it's because animals cannot enter into contracts that they lack membership in the moral community. Um, and because some people think that rights themselves or morality is some type of quasi uh, contract based system where basically people agree to um, refrain from certain actions against others and sort of tacitly assume that in response others won't um, you know violate their own interests and rights and so people um, are willing to like follow moral principles and laws and norms uh, out of the desired reciprocity of uh, co-equal treatment that others would give them, then that would protect, of course, their own interests. But if you can't make uh, a commitment to a contract, understand what a contract is, what it limits you from doing, what it, it entitles you to, uh, to on your side, then uh, you couldn't possibly be a, a being that holds rights. At least that's, um, you know, the view of the contractarians. So anyway, Regan, who argues animals do have rights just because they're subjects of a life, he contends with this point as well. He says the basic problem with the contractarian view is that if you think about it, it does not even actually establish or guarantee uh, rights to all cases of human beings, even those which we do think have rights. For example, the mentally disabled humans or the very small children in the world uh, that maybe don't have the ability either to engage in um, contracts or to understand what they really are or what they mean. But we don't think they are just fair game to use for our purposes against their will or that they can be used as a means for our ends. Um, so he thinks in, to, in order to be consistent, you cannot simply draw the line around having rights or membership in a moral community or moral status around capacity to enter into contracts because it would eliminate certain humans from the same moral standing. Now, some try to refine the contractarian view by expressing uh, allegiance to the ideas of John Rawls, in particular, his concept of the veil of ignorance. The veil of ignorance was this hypothetical which said, if we were to have the most fair and equal and just society, uh, like theoretically speaking, it would be nice to have, or it would, it would generate the right type of society if we could have the people that are engaged in making the rules and laws um, 
place them behind a veil of ignorance. And what the veil of ignorance is supposed to do is it's supposed to remove from the individual any knowledge that they would otherwise have about their own identity. So they don't know their gender, age, you know, uh, orientation, political philosophy, wealth and income status, job title or profession. They just denied all information about their own identity. And so you'd think in that case that the people making rules with the veil of ignorance on would be so um, risk averse that they would not want to like tilt the scales in favor of one group or another to the disadvantage of some and not others, because in that case, they would worry that when the veil was removed, they would have created um, non-equal conditions for themselves. So rational self-interest would kind of constrain them to make the best laws. So um, some people think, okay, well, um, the contractarian view could be okay, uh, because even if you thought, well, there's no limit to what a contract can be, people can make a moral contract that says, let's regard some members of the human race as totally subhuman and will just ignore their needs or even worse. Um, with a veil of ignorance, maybe you wouldn't have that result because you'd be worried if the veil was removed and you ended up being one of these people that you had chosen to marginalize. Um, but it still, he thinks, doesn't, permit, doesn't prevent certain types of exclusion from moral concern of those that are not rational. Because even with the veil of ignorance on, you would know at least that you are a rational human being capable of instituting rules um, and therefore, you could still make in exclusions for non-rational humans or for people like that have mental disabilities and stuff. So whether it be the classical contractarian approach or the more refined uh, Rawlsian veil of ignorance twist, um, Regan thinks that there's not any great support for trying to establish who or what has rights along those lines. Um, yeah, and then so finally he attacks utilitarianism itself and he says utilitarian theory um, it also is not willing to say that there are absolute rights. It says uh, that there's just calculations of utility and whatever generates the most is the action that should be favored morally, even if, um, let's say, it violates what some call rights. It's all about just maximizing total happiness. Um, <clears throat> now, that might establish, like Peter Singer's position, that we shouldn't um, cause undue pain for bad or for, for trivial reasons to the animals. Uh, because their pain and pleasure should be weighed in a utilitarian judgment, perhaps. Um, but even re, uh, even Singer doesn't go as far as to say the animals have rights. He's comfortable saying that if they were not made to suffer throughout their life, then painlessly being euthanized and used for a human purpose afterward, perhaps, could be morally permitted because they might not have a full conception of their future interests and stuff, like, you know, uh, like was argued in the case of the fetus. Um, so it's just about minimizing pain and such and maximizing overall pleasure for a singer type. But Regan doesn't think that goes far enough because it doesn't guarantee rights. So why does he find utilitarianism flawed in general terms? Well, he says that utilitarianism, again, it cannot guarantee the existence of rights and therefore it doesn't side with our intuitions about certain kind of example cases. He gives the case of Aunt B, a hypothetical subject who is unliked by everybody and um, there's a short window of time in which if she was to die, her inheritance would be transferred to her nephew who would use it to create a lot of benefit in the world, maybe donate to important charities or cancer research or something else. And um, if this money is not transferred to him because she doesn't die within that one month period, then she'll be eliminating him from the will and she'll just spend it all on diamonds or something and be buried with those. So if it was just about maximizing total happiness, the argument goes, you'd think a utilitarian of a classical type would say that maybe he should kill his aunt, you know, so that this money that she's otherwise gonna withhold uh, could be used for much more human benefit. But of course, most would say that's wrong, regardless of whether the utilitarian might favor the act. It just doesn't strike you as intuitively correct because doesn't she have inherent value, value of her own, uh, in, on her own, without reference to how useful she may be to others? And that's another thread that kind of runs throughout Regan's paper that we were reviewing last time, that when something has inherent value, that means it's valuable in and of itself without reference to how useful it can be to anyone else. A thing that has only got instrumental value is only valuable as a means to an end. And so if it can't serve to that end, then it's got no intrinsic value of its own. So um, we think of ourselves as having inherent value. And some people think animals can be used for instruments to man's purposes, like for you know clothing, food, or experiments. Uh, he says, no, the things which have rights, the things which should be treated and accorded, um, you know, the status of not being treated as a means to an end, uh, are just subjects of a life, as was mentioned earlier, the things that 
um, you know, can be subconscious, sub that can be conscious, that can feel things, that can perceive, and that have a, a point of view and a, a, a ability to, you know, at least have perception. So in the end, he's kind of like a Kantian. I remember I ended with that on you guys last time. He's kind of like a Kantian, but with a twist, because Kant himself had anim said animals have no rights, right? He said they have no direct moral standing uh, because they're not able to have reason. What Regan takes from Kant is the point that when something has moral standing, it should never be treated as a means, but always as an end. And he's willing to say that that's something that Kant had, which was true, but he just departs a little bit from it by expanding the sphere of things that have that standing. He says it's not just uh, rational creatures, but just subjects of a life that we should never treat as a means, always as an end. Okay, so today we're wrapping up these uh, last few points on um, the animal ethics topic um, with our final few authors. So. We're beginning with Marianne Warren here. <clears throat> okay, Marianne Warren, let me just get the glare down. Uh, you guys, we all know Marianne Warren because this is like one of the first authors we studied earlier in the semester. She's um, well known for her uh, work in the abortion ethics literature and uh, she wrote the paper um, on the moral and legal status of abortion, which had the whole argument that the fetus is not a person and lacks the characteristics of personhood. Um, but now she's back and she wants to talk to us also about another inter interesting topic, which is this one, the topic of animals and whether they have rights. So her paper is called The Rights of the Non-Human World. Rights of the Non-Human World, and this is, by the way, from 1983, so about 10 years after her uh, classic paper on abortion and the ethics of that, pro-choice paper, if you remember. Okay, so Marianne Warren, The Rights of the Non-Human World. So we're coming back to Warren. Again, we already discussed her work on abortion and the moral status of the fetus, the human fetus. Um, she begins this new paper by saying that in Western thought and in Western philosophy, uh, the general consensus for a long time has been that only humans are objects of moral concern directly, and that duties to animals are at best indirect. Okay, so the Kantian type of view, the view that is reflected in the everyday practice of eating meat and so forth, the general widespread majority position is that animals are not directly objects of moral concern. Humans are, um, and it would be wrong to kill, harm, or abused, you know, human uh, against the person's will, of course, but animals may be used for human purposes. So again, that's the general consensus view. And she just points that out to start. This view could be called an anthropocentric view. We used that term earlier when we started, when we started this unit of the course, anthropocentrism is the belief that um, only humans have moral status and non-humans and the uh, environment have only got indirect standing due to maybe the interest that we impose on them. Um, but she also uses this sort of synonym for the word anthropocentric. She says homocentric, as in reference to like um, homo sapiens. Uh, I'll stick with anthropocentric, but just you know, if you see it in the textbook uh, as you read the essay, that she might use a similar label homocentric. Anyway, the homocentric anthropocentric view is the view that only humans have moral standing and animals uh, are at best of indirect concern morally. Um, but that view could be challenged from two different directions. Okay, so two challenges to anthropocentric morality. Sorry if I may. I'm just going to quickly grab a uh, tissue to wipe down the um, whiteboard here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, two challenges to anthropocentric morality. Okay, again, anthropocentric meaning like only humans have moral status, only humans have rights or whatever. So two challenges. One she calls environmentalism. Uh, 
And then the other, um, animal liberationism, okay? <clears throat> Okay, so in first environmentalism, what that says is that all of nature and the environment has moral status. All of nature and the environment has moral status. That's the environmentalist view. And that's opposed to anthropocentric morality because this obviously does not just say that it's only humans that have moral value. It says that it's everything that's living, that's part of nature, that's part of the environment. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But the other view that also challenges the anthropocentric standard is animal liberationism. And it says that a sentient uh, being, sentient creatures, meaning they can feel, they can sense pleasure and pain, uh, sentient uh, life forms uh, have moral status. <clears throat> okay, so sentient creatures have moral status. That's the animal liberationist view. So the animal liberationist also thinks that um, it's not merely humans that we should encircle inside of the moral community, but that we need to also include within it other things that are non-humans, but in their case, they're focused specifically on the things that are non-human, which can feel and have sensations. So the environmentalist would say that all of nature matters morally, and we should protect not just animals and their interests, but also things that don't have capacity to have sensations, like, for example, the rainforests or the coral reefs um, or any other number of aspects of the natural environment. So they would say we have to protect and care for the entire biosphere, the entire ecosystem. And so according to the environmentalist, the human part of nature, our part, is not the part that should dominate over um, the rest of the biosystem. We're just like a citizen of nature, as it were, one small part of it, and we should therefore see ourselves as stewards of nature, as caretakers of nature, but not as somehow uh, lording over it and using it as something that's disposable or a means to our ends. Um, there's an author named Aldo Leopold, and um, he wrote a book called The Land Ethic. And uh, Leopold's book about the land ethic really does capture some of the classic doctrines of the environmentalist moral perspective. Um, again, his position is we're not above nature. We should see ourselves as just members or citizens of it, this larger system of which we're one part, and just try to be good. Um, you know, stakeholders in the overall system of nature that care for all of its parts and the community of all of its parts. Um, on the other hand, the animal liberationists ethic, while it shares in common with these guys that anthropocentrism is false, it uh, narrows the focus of the moral universe a little bit just to those things that have feelings, sensations, and especially the capacity for pain. So the animal liberationist says that the capacity for pain that animals have uh, makes them a little bit more distinct from, let's say, wetlands and streams that don't have feelings, you know. So it's the animals that are among us which have feelings and can pay, feel pleasure and pain like ourselves that we should include in that moral community. So the two perspectives, they have some things that are in common, but they also have some, you know, individual aspects that are different. In common, they both deny that it's only human beings that matter morally in this world. They do, But they don't agree on how far the sphere of moral concern should extend. Um, and they also differ in other ways that could be seen in perhaps policies that one might be willing to accept while the other might not. As you're watching this, let me just uh, hit you with a quick, um, just simple question. Between these two types of views, which one do you think would be maybe more willing to accept the issuing of hunting permits to reduce the level of predators in a given natural habitat to bring it more into balance with the level of prey uh, that they're predating on? So again, between environmentalists and animal liberationists, uh, who would be at least somewhat open to the moral uh, possibility of, you know, allowing the issuing of hunting permits to bring a biosystem or habitat into balance? 
Well, if you're thinking about the environmentalist, you're right. So that's the case because an environmentalist would say that as much as, um, you know, it's too bad maybe for the individual animals that are harmed through the issuing of the permits, the goal is to protect the environment as a whole. So this is holistic and this is a little bit more individualistic. The animal liberationist cares about every single animal and its individual capacity for pain and pleasure. This rather focuses on the protection and sustainability of the total environment, even if in some cases you might have to like, I don't know, break a few eggs as it were to get to a better status quo for all of nature considered as a whole. Now, Mary Ann Warren, our author right now, she points these po uh, she points these views out and she says, to get to the right perspective on the moral standing of animals or what maybe our obligations to our to to them are or are not, we're going to have to actually um, borrow elements from both of these two perspectives. She thinks the correct viewpoint requires some elements of either one, but each one kind of has to make some concessions and meet in the middle to get to the right perspective. Perspective. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, so the animal liberationists, uh, what they have to kind of concede, according to her, is that even if animals have rights, they're not exactly the same scope or the same strength as would be the case in human rights. So she says, I'll meet you in the middle, perhaps. We can say animals have rights, but even if they do, um, you should be willing to concede that they're not exactly quite as strong as they would be in the case of a human with the same right. We'll come back to that. On the other hand, she says, the environmentalists also have to realize that if things like trees and mountains, you know, and natural landscapes have rights, then they're very different from the rights that either humans or animals could have simply because they're lacking in sentience and conscious feelings and thoughts. So her paper's kind of structured into four sections. In the first section, she tries to examine the basic argument that's given by um, those that defend animal rights, and she tries to show how their conclusions ought to be modified or somewhat adjusted to make them a little bit more intuitive. In the second section, she tries to then present two arguments which allow us to distinguish between the rights of humans and animals. So she wants to try and show how um, there are distinctions among what rights a human could have as opposed to a non-human animal. In the third section, she wants to consider what um, the animal rights advocates' objections would be, including the objection that uh, any effort to distinguish between non-human animals um, and humans would also endanger the rights of, of non-human, uh, oh, sorry, of humans that have learning disabilities or have cognitive dis disabilities or perhaps um, are senile or, or have brain damage or something. So again, um, animal rights advocates like ones that we've already studied, Singer, Regan, right, they always make this point that um, if you deny the rights of animals because of some cognitive limitation or lacking that they may have with comparison to rational adult human beings uh, that runs the risk of also setting aside the rights of certain humans that are uh, non-optimal in their cognitive functioning. Um, and so Warren wants to try and deal with that point by trying to raise a distinction that could be allowing us to see the different cases, uh, the different moral standing, in other words, of a non-human animal as opposed to a human with low cognitive functioning similar on that level as an animal. And finally, in the fourth session, she tries to reply to various objections to any attempt to base the rights of, of, uh, of a being on their level of sentience or, or uh, consciousness. Okay, so let's then clear this away. We've seen two challenges to anthropocentric morality. Long story short, Warren's going to try to say that the correct perspective on this topic has to somewhat uh, borrow elements from either of the two because neither one is completely correct on its own. <clears throat> okay, so first section then, as we go past her just intro remarks, Roman numeral one, she, la she labels this why some animals have some moral rights. Okay, why some animals have some moral rights. So as she, she writes it like this with some in parentheses, as if it's like an afterthought that you'd say sort of in your mind. So why some animals um, have not all but some moral rights. So notice right away um, how how qualified she's making the title of this section, right? She's not saying why animals have rights, you know, just full stop. Instead she's saying, well why some, not all, animals have some 
but not all, of the moral rights. So what can be said about that? Well, she begins by referring to the work of Peter Singer, well known to us by now on this topic. And um, what he said was that all sentient animals should be regarded as morally equal because uh, like interests should be given equal consideration. And the interest they have in avoiding pain and their capacity to feel pain is all that should matter morally when it comes to our decisions about how to treat them. Um, so again, from the point of view of Singer, who she's just now citing and referring to, um, if we don't regard the pain of animals with equal regard to human pain, then that would be speciesism. And she also points out that there are other authors that follow a similar or even more um, strident um, logic on the animal pro-animal side. For example, Tom Regan, he adopts an even stronger stance that utilitarian considerations aren't even good enough. We have to give these animals full rights, uh, a status that utilitarian considerations could not override. But Warren wants to take issue at least a little bit with what both of those authors have said. She notes that both seem to recognize some difference in the moral status of animals as opposed to humans. Because for example, Peter Singer, as much as he's arguing for the equal consideration principle and having that applied to animals, he also says that equal consideration is not the exact same thing as equal treatment because he's fully aware that there are some interests that humans have that animals don't have. For example, you know, an interest in voting or getting married or practicing a religion or a freedom of speech. So um, not every right would then correspond. Only where there are common interests should they be given common weight or equal weight. Um, maybe we have a common interest in avoiding pain, which is very basic and low level, but there's so many other rights that wouldn't apply to the animals because there couldn't possibly be an interest in the, such a thing. Regan also says that some animals have some of the same rights we do, but like Singer, he understands that it would not make sense to ascribe to them all the rights that we have, including, you know, again, like the right to vote or something that would just not make sense as applied to an animal. So Warren pointing out their partial concessions of Singer and Regan, that they don't have every single right because there's some maybe interests or uh, things that they couldn't have in common with us. Warren wants to drill down on that, and she says, let's more clearly articulate why these differences exist in the scope of the moral status and rights of animals as opposed to humans. That there is such a difference in the standing and rights uh, holder status of us as opposed to animals, that there is a difference between them and us, she thinks that that's very obvious, and she gives a few cases which she thinks will bring out this intuition. She says, okay, now imagine that there's a guy who's shooting at squirrels for sport. We're talking about a person who's firing off, you know, a gun and shooting at little squirrels. Why? We're not talking about someone who's eating the squirrels, you know. They're not exactly a lot of meat there anyway. So, uh, you know, um, we're not talking about someone who's using the squirrels for some other important purpose, like, I don't know, a squirrel uh, moccasins or gloves or something out of their fur. No, no. Just shooting at them as like target practice and killing a bunch of them by doing it. Now, probably you would think that the person who's shooting at squirrels for sport is maybe acting in a bad way because they're kind of just gratuitously eliminating living things for no significant reason or cause, just for amusement. Huh? But she says, as bad as that is, what if we switch the example and we say that it's a human being that's doing this for sport to other human beings? Okay, so uh, not squirrels. Uh, you know, like a person who's just picking off shots at people from a freeway overpass or from a clock tower of a building or something, and they're doing it as like target practice for them. Now, those are both very bad things I would say to do, but she believes, and I think most of us would probably side with the view, that if you had to, if you're forced to choose which one is morally a worse act, um, that it's obviously the worst act when the person is doing it to humans as opposed to the squirrels. Now, we are humans, so you might be thinking, well, of course, we're going to say that because we're biased in favor of our own kind. Um, but is that all that it is? Is this just mere speciesism when we have the more reaction to the two examples, um, saying that it seems so obvious and clear that there is a worse um, violation of morality happening when it's done to humans as opposed to animals? So are these intuitions that it is worse reasonable? Are they based on something rational, or is it an expression of mere speciesism? In the end, she doesn't think that it's just pure speciesism. It has to do with the different capacities for interests that we have as compared to non-human animals. So to probe the question further, she says we need to consider what the relevant similarities and differences are between ourselves and other animals. 
For example, what does it mean to say that a being possesses a moral right? Um, she gives us her own little sketchy analysis of what it means to have rights. So that's written on page 607 of the textbook. You would find it there. Um, and it says this. Um, so here's her uh, like logical analysis. X has a right to Y just in case. Two things, all right? Let me write the whole formula out here, her whole way of expressing this principle or definition. So X is just a label or it's a variable we're just using as a placeholder for some individual. So X is a being. X has a right to Y. Now the letter Y is just to stand for whatever the right might be to or about. So X has a right, sorry, to Y, may I? Okay, X has a right to Y um, just in case, or let's just say it means this, means number one, that it would be morally wrong for anyone to deprive X of Y without a good enough reason. Okay, so one point, if something has a right to something, like say I have a right to vote, then that would mean first that it would be morally wrong for anyone to deliberately deprive me of that thing without a good enough reason, without a good enough justification. Okay, so if I have a right to something, then it's not something you can just casually take away from me. Uh, if I have a right to something, like I have a right to my property, you know, like my car, that means that it would be morally right, sorry, <laughs> that it would be morally wrong for anyone to intentionally deprive me of my car without a good enough reason. Like, what's a good enough reason for taking my car? I don't know, maybe as a asset that's being claimed by a bank if I've gone defaulted on a, a loan, or maybe um, uh, it's collected as evidence because I committed a crime with it, or, you know, but there has to be some exceptional reason um, for you to have a good enough justification for depriving me of it if it's my right. So having a right to something means that if anyone takes it away from you on purpose, that that's wrong unless they have a good enough reason for that. Okay. So for example, if it was just theft that was the reason, um, then that would be a violation of my, my right to that thing. Okay. Anyway, point number two, that this would be wrong, that this deprivation of a thing would be wrong uh, because of the actual harm that it would do to the interests of X, okay? So, Okay, so here's the basic, uh, you know, long, long story short about this. If something has a right to something else, two things are implied by that. First, that if, uh, if you don't have a good enough reason, then it would be wrong for anyone to deliberately take that away from them, the thing they have a right to. And then number two, that that would be a wrong thing to do because of the actual harm that it would do to the interests of X. So it has to be X themselves and their interests that is somehow harmed if what you're taking away from them constitutes the violation of their rights. Okay, so if I have a right to something, that only makes sense if taking it from me does harm to my actual interests. Okay, so um, I cannot say that I have a right to... Um, I don't know, let me think of an example here, something that if you took it away, it wouldn't really uh, debar my interest at all. Um, okay, so suppose that I, I claim that I have a, so, so like uh, I have a right to have someone wear red in one of my classrooms and nobody does it. 
um, obviously I would be talking nonsense because um, suppose that nobody wore red on that day. That's not an actual harm done to my interest. No, none of my material interests would be harmed in any significant way. Maybe this is a bad example because I could at least be aware that they were not doing something that I had wanted. So let's try another case. Um, <clears throat> suppose that somebody says that I'm not allowed to, um, I'm not allowed to eat a, 2,000 pounds of food in a single sitting. They deprive me of that. They're like, we have one rule in this like little land or territory. You're never allowed to eat 2,000 pounds of food in one sitting. Well, it would be ridiculous to say that I had that that violates my rights. Okay, that would not possibly violate my rights because there would be no harm done to my actual interest because I could never possibly have an interest in eating 2,000 pounds of food because I'm not even physically capable of it. You see, so for me to have a right to something, it has to be the sort of thing that if you were to deliberately take it away from me or from anything, it would actually harm the interest of that thing. So it would have to at least be possible for the thing to have an interest in that thing. Okay, so a precondition for having rights is that uh, the thing that you have a right to has to be something that you're at least capable of having an interest in. So whether animals have rights to say certain things depends on whether they are, there are some ways of treating them which are wrong because of the harm done to the animal's interests, not because of some indirect reason, okay? So in some cases, we can clearly see that such rights do exist. For example, to not be tortured, to not be starved, confined, or to be generally treated inhumanely, because those are things which an animal can have an interest in it not having done to them. The animal has interest in avoiding pain, captivity, starvation, as they exhibit clearly with their behavior. Um, so Warren accepts that much. She says animals may have some basic rights, like rights not to be tortured or needlessly made to suffer. But even in those cases, the rights are easier to stand and override in the animal case as compared to humans. So now we get to the next section of her paper, which talks about human and animal rights compared. But again, to summarize the first section, she says um, animals may have some rights, but even if they have some rights, it depends on which things uh, are actually in their own interests that they themselves have an interest in. Um, so whether an animal has a right to something depends on whether there are certain ways of treating them which would do harm to their interests, not to our interests applied to them or something else. So the next section, section two, human and animal rights compared. Okay, so section two, Roman numeral two. <clears throat> In the end, guys, uh, just to sort of anticipate where this is all going, Warren's going to try to stake out a kind of middle ground position. She's going to, on the one hand, uh, try to show that maybe animals do have some rights. But on the other hand, she's also going to say, even if they do, though, they're not generally as strong as ours are. Um, and that's going to be her kind of nuanced middle of the road position. It's not necessarily going to make anybody very happy to so the animal rights people. They're going to say, well, that means that you're willing to say they don't have rights like on a same par with humans. But to people that are total defenders of the status quo, they might also find it somewhat frustrating that she's saying there are some rights that they do have, though, even if they're not co-equal to ours. OK, so here we go to the next section. This is where I think the most important parts of the essay and her topic uh, of argument are. So she says here that there's two different sorts of uh, distinctions that pertain to rights. So uh, <clears throat> two distinctions about rights. Okay, so there's strength, the strength of the right, and then there's content, the content of the right. Okay, so the strength of the right, well, let's go over the content first. The content of the right is what the right is a right to. What the right is a right to, okay? So um, 
there are many different contents of different rights. I could have a right to vote, a right to life, a right to my property, um, a right to non-discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. And so each of those is a different content. The right to practice a religion that I want is not the same thing as the right to vote. You know, those are different contents. So whatever the content of the right is, that's what the right is the right to do or to not do. Um, okay, so then there's strength. <clears throat> strength is how powerful, how significant do the reasons have to be to override, to legitimately override the right? Okay, so... Okay, I hope it's easy enough to read. I know it's a little compressed there with my legibility. I'll, I'll try to read it out and maybe I'll type it here too really fast. So strength. Um, So anyway, it says uh, strength, how strong the reasons have to be in order to legitimately override the right. So that's strength. Um, that means what kind of quality reasons do you have to have before it becomes okay to set that right aside or to, at least in one case, um, you know, abridge the right? Um, as an example, I have right to property, you know, um, but... If there's a good enough reason, maybe there's something that could override my right to this property, like maybe the fact that, I don't know, I had gone into such deep debt that the bank could put out a lien on some of my property and confiscate it or garnish my wages if I was like, I don't know, um, way delinquent on tax payments or something. So I would have to have somehow have breached a rule or law uh, for the seizure of my property to be legitimate. There have to be very good reasons for that. Um, on the other hand, Let's consider the differences between human and animal rights by considering the difference of content and strength. What she wants to show and argue is that um, even when we have rights with the same content as animals between the two of us, even in those cases, I should put it this way, where animals have rights with the same content as ours, it's often the case, she says, that they're not as strong as ours. So we can sort of have it both ways. Yes, we may have the same rights content-wise, but differing with respect to how much strength there is, which means that it would be easier to override their weaker strength rights to the same thing than it would be to justify overriding the more high strength rights that we have got. So um, property doesn't necessarily apply. I think that was probably not the best example. Let me use her example now to make the point as pertaining to the differing nature of human as compared to animal rights. So consider the right to liberty, okay? Liberty and and freedom. Um, consider the human right to liberty. Let me ask you this question. Would you feel like you had your right to liberty respected or violated if I told you that from now on you just can never leave your house for the rest of your life? I mean, so you can do whatever you want inside the house, but the second that you try to step outside of it in any way, you can be dead on sight. Would you say that that is um, per, is is consistent with your right to liberty or does that violate your right to liberty? And I'm sure I, I want it to be an easy one for you. This one is easy. It's obvious. I would not, that would violate your right to liberty. Okay. Because you could understand how you're being denied access to like the whole world outside of your house. So clearly that would stand as a violation because you can understand what you would be losing. You, you'd be able to contemplate yourself in all these extra places, right? Uh, well, let's take it a stage further. What if I say, well, you can leave your house, but you cannot leave, um, California, the state of California. I, I, I kind of jumped a little bit too far. Maybe I'll make it a little stage smaller. See, when I'm teaching this in a live setting, I know we're all in the same city. Um, so let's just make it your city, the city that you live in. We're now going to permit you to go to any area within the city, but as soon as you try to step over to the next town, next over, now you're going to be killed on site. Do you feel like that is going to respect your liberty rights, or is that still in violation of them? And probably you would still think, yeah, that's not enough liberty 
for a human being that is aware of all the possibilities of travel and um, experience that lie outside the city. So now I say, what if it's the state of California? But as soon as you try to, you know, trek over to like one other state, whether it's Arizona or Oregon or, you know, Nevada or something, and then you'll be killed again, you still would probably feel like I'm not free. And again, like we can keep expanding this out. But if I said that you can never leave the country, you'd probably also think that you didn't have your liberty. So for a human like you and me, because of our mental ability to comprehend all the possibilities of global travel and experience and so forth, we would probably feel like our liberty had been uh, curtailed in a way that violated our rights if we were not free to travel in almost limited range across the globe. But now let's change the example to an animal. Um, an animal, if it's given a reasonable approximation to its own habitat and is well cared for, it's not going to be frustrated at all if it lives its entire life on, like, say, one plot of land. Um, it's not like the animal could think of, for example, oh, I know that I'm here on this comfortable little plot of land, but um, I always wanted to see the Eiffel Tower, or I always wanted to see the pyramids, or maybe I always wanted to watch the ball drop in New York. Um, and if you leave me here, I can't go and experience all those things. It's not able to contemplate all the opportunities for, you know, interesting human cultures and different environments. As long as it's living in a reasonable approximation to its natural habitat, it would not be significantly frustrated. But the same conditions that it is put in, living its life out on a farm, would be like prison for a human being because of our different scope of knowledge. So what she's saying here is maybe you and I have both got liberty rights and so maybe do certain animals. Same content. But even if so, their right to that thing is generally weaker than ours because of the dimmer scope of awareness they have as to how far it could extend. You see, that's kind of trying to finesse a middle ground here by saying that animals may have rights of a kind, but they're generally weaker because the animal doesn't have the same mental awareness of the full scope and nature of the right as we would have. So it's our higher intellect here that secures for us the more powerful right, the stronger right to liberty, because we're more informed and in understanding about what we stand to lose or what would be being denied to us in any such effort to deprive us of that liberty. Um, so the conditions which would be wrong in the human case, leaving us for a lifetime on one farm, don't significantly frustrate the needs or desires of animals. I mean, look, I have house cats. You know, I have two cats here that live in my house, and we have a little yard outside, which, to be fair, they like to go out in every day, you know, and uh, they try to make that part of their daily routine. They just get a little more space. But even this nice house, these four bedrooms and nice big yard and stuff, um, it's not like they're seeing much of the world, right? You know, it's not like they're even getting out on the block. Um, but I don't feel like this is violating the rights that they have because they're not necessarily so aware of all the experiences that are otherwise uh, available to, like, say, a human that would definitely be living a confined and, um, you know, uh, life de depriving and denying them their liberty if they were confined to a household in the same way as a cat. So, again... Um, a rights violation, if it was done to a human, leaving them in that small environment for their whole life because of their thought process of what they would be missing, not the rights violation on behalf of the animal whose awareness of what liberty amounts to and what it could extend with uh, is, is necessarily much more um, uh, or less sophisticated. So again, humans require an almost unlimited extensive freedom of movement to avoid feeling frustrated from our needs and interests with respect to liberty than do animals. And again, uh, there are also many human rights that don't even apply to animals, like freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of um, uh, to petition the government. Um, similar things could be said about the right to life. So not just the right to liberty, which maybe they have in, in same content, but weaker strength, but the right to life too. She argues that animals have a weaker right to life than humans, even if they may have a right to life, it's weaker, and why? Because they cannot have the same amount of value that they invest in their own lives as we do. They cannot, for example, contemplate long-range plans and goals. And that's what gives humans such a powerful interest in the continuation of their own lives. You know, think about all the things that you're hoping to happen in the future, whether it's graduating college or getting a career or a job or buying a house, having kids, starting a family, and watching your kids go to school. Like, seeing future technology, seeing another movie that's coming out in like a year from now um, that you're waiting on. If your life was to end now, you'd be aware of the loss of all the future experiences. And you'd also be um, fully aware that there's um, something precious and finite that was being lost. An animal, on the other hand, kind of just lives in the moment and they don't um, have a, 
a sort of complicated structure of a future plan laid out ahead of them as humans chart things off on the calendar and plan some things for years and years over time in advance. So that's why she thinks that even if animals may have a right to life, it can't be as strong as the humans because they just don't have the same sense of how uh, precious their own lives are and they don't have the same ability to actively contemplate um, the type of future that they're otherwise being denied. Um, that's why Warren is comfortable saying that if a bird dies, maybe it's a tragedy, but it's not as tragic as the death of a human because the human is more aware of everything that they stand to lose yet again. Um, so human lives, she argues, are more valuable uh, and have greater strength of rights because they're worth more to those that possess them. At the same time, she's trying to walk this middle ground, and she says, despite that, I'm not saying that no animal has the right to life. Uh, as she quotes her, uh, as I'm quoting her here on page 609, she says, um, these reflections probably help to explain why the death of a sparrow seems less tragic than that of a human being. Human lives, one might say, have a greater intrinsic value because they are worth more to their possessors. But this does not demonstrate that no non-human animal has any right to life. Premature death may be a less severe misfortune for sentient non-human animals than for humans, but it is a misfortune nonetheless. In the first place, it is a misfortune in that it deprives them of whatever future pleasures they might have held, whether they uh, either consciously or did not anticipate them. The fact that they're not here afterwards to experience their loss no more shows that they have not lost anything than it does in the case of humans. But in the second place, it is possibly a misfortune in that it frustrates whatever future-oriented desires animals may have unbeknownst to us. Um, so going down a little further, she says, For these reasons, it is premature to conclude from the apparent intellectual inferiority of non-human animals that they have no right to life. A more plausible conclusion is that animals do have a right to life, but that it is generally somewhat weaker than that of human beings. It is perhaps weak enough to enable us to justify killing animals when we have no other way of achieving such goods as feeding or clothing ourselves, obtaining knowledge which is needed to save human lives. Weakening their right to life in this way does not render meaningless the assertion that they have such a right, because the point remains that some justification for the killing of sentient non-human animals is always needed. They may not be killed merely to provide amusement or minor gains and convenience. Okay, so, um, again, there's a distinction in rights, content versus strength. Content, what the right is about, strength, how powerful do the reasons have to be for you to, uh, for you to legitimately uh, override the right and set it to the side. Um, in many cases, animals couldn't have the same rights as us, even regarding content, because uh, some interests can't possibly apply to them, like interest in voting or marriage or religion, etc. But sometimes where there is a content that overlaps, it may still be that the animal's right to that is weaker because of their lower mental um, apprehension of what the right amounts to or how far it extends. So that's why she's now made these two separate points, that if you talk about the right to life, you could say animals and humans both have it, but the animal right to it is weaker uh, because the things that would legitimately frustrate their interests um, are not the same things as what would legitimately frustrate a human's interest in the same. If you keep me on a two acre plot of land for my whole life, I'm gonna be frustrated and feeling like my liberty is denied because I'll be thinking about all the things I can't do. An animal on the other hand is, res is reasonably satisfied in that condition because it can't be contemplating as a human would be all the possibilities and opportunities that it's not able to access. And now we go to the right to life. Animals may have an interest in living, but they may not have the same kind of detailed awareness of all of the possibilities that their future life holds. So a human jealously guards the preservation of their life because they're aware that it will end, and they're also aware of how many things lie ahead of them that they still desire. An animal, on the other hand, is living more in the moment, is not making long-range plans, and future goals are not necessarily in mind. So their lives are not as valued to the individual possessors of them in the animal as opposed to the human case. So it's easy enough then to justify overriding the animal's right to life if what we're doing by killing them is getting food or medical and scientific information or clothing. Uh, but doing that for a human being would not be okay because even if they have the same right to life, there's so much stronger, it's incompatible with these justifications being legitimate or good enough. Um, okay, so... Warren says that the more plausible view is that they have a right to life, which is weaker than a human right to life. It's weak enough to justify killing if we have no other way to feed, clothe, or obtain vital info, but not for mere sport or amusement. In regards to pain, though, she does think that their interest in avoiding that is on par with our own, 
uh, because their behavior is exactly identical to human behavior in terms of aversion to pain. So she would say then that that right, at least, to be pain, free of pain and suffering uh, is of equal strength. Um, now, some say their rights don't exist at all because they lack the capacity for moral judgment, like that was, say, Kant or Cohen. Warren doesn't agree with that, though. Why should capacity for that be a precondition for having rights? After all, there are many humans who also cannot assert their rights, uh, maybe because of cognitive disability or otherwise. But that seems irrelevant in that case, and we grant them such rights. But again, still Warren allows this idea that, um, though not a basis to deny rights altogether, it may be an additional reason to see that humans have stronger rights. Um, we, by the way, can understand the reciprocity of rights and duties. So we have, therefore, um, more respect for that moral treatment of others because we see ourselves as mutually cooperating to uphold the system of rights. But animals cannot enter into any situation with a baseline expectation of reasonable or fair treatment as equals. So when they're not treated that way, then it's not as much of a violation of what they had uh, come to expect as would be in the case of a human. So like if you were to rob me, that would be a big abnormality in my life because I would say this is something that you're not supposed to do according to our laws, our customs, and our everyday norms. But if an animal has something taken from it, um, you know, supposing that it was like, you know, uh, a cluster of uh, like an animal carcass in the wild that another animal came and stole away from it, it's not that it could think, hey, you have no right to do that. This isn't how we act as animals because uh, it can't have any expectations to be treated differently. So um, treatment that is extended to animals, which would, again, violate human rights to the same don't necessarily do in the case of animals, once again, because of their different uh, mental awareness of the situations they find themselves in. Now, some people say that some type of arguments similar to these have been used to historically justify um, forms of bigotry against those um, that are different from a favored or power holding group in society. But to Warren, there's no real co uh, obvious connection between bigotry and elevating the rights of humans over non-animals. Um, because in the case of human forms of bigotry, whether it's racism, sexism, ableism, um, the separate categories of people in the two categories, the one discriminating, the one being discriminated against, are not inferior to one another in any way. But animals, of course, you might say really are uh, intellectually and morally inferior to us. So therefore, the unequal treatment or the demotion of the strength of their rights it's not on the same par with like diminishing the rights of a religious minority or something where those people are just as much human in all relevant respects equal to those that are discriminating against them. But we have to now return to a theme that's been a kind of hallmark of this whole uh, moral debate, which is does trying to deny the full strength of rights to the non-human animals because of their cognitive um, limitations as compared to ours does that run the risk of having bad implications for the mentally disabled or the cognitively low functioning that might be then said to also have weaker strength of rights? So how is she going to deal with that? The moral rights, in other words, of what she calls non-paradigm humans, meaning humans, but that have lower levels of intellectual functioning such that they're similar to the intellectual functioning of like, you know, non-human animals. Well, you might be surprised to hear that Warren is going to try and uh, stick her neck out and make this argument because Obviously, she's already made another powerful argument that's very well known about abortion, and she said that the fetus doesn't have a right to life because it's not a person. Now, though, she wants to make this argument that intellectually disabled human beings shouldn't be lumped together with animals as these beings that have lower strength rights than mature adult humans do. Um, so she's going to have to try and make some distinction then between non-paradigm humans, as she calls them, which could include the fetus, by the way, but anyway, we'll keep it to the mentally disabled and so on for now. The non-paradigm humans as opposed to non-human animals. So what's that distinction? Okay, so. In non-paradigm humans, just meaning that like this is not the typical case, like a person born with a mental disability or something, perhaps, um, you know, they're a human being with value and everything else, but at the same time, 
that's not the typical result from a pregnancy. Um, it's the exception, you know, it's, it's the, um, it's not the norm and it's not the majority case. So, um, what's the difference then morally between the non-human animals and the non-paradigm humans? Cause if you've been following the trajectory of her argument, she's gone out of her way to say non-human animals have, have weaker strength rights than humans, even when they're of the same content, most of all, because they don't have the same intellectual grasp of the full ramifications of the right and what it implies as a human would. So that's why those rights can be easily, more easily abridged or easier to justify the reasons for violating them than a human could be. But if that's the case, then wouldn't non-paradigm non humans, like low intellectual functioning humans, also be subject to the same moral classification, thus debarring them from having rights on par with our own? So what could be the difference? Because she wants to say there's a difference. She doesn't want to be sort of like characterized as saying that um, since animals don't have very strong rights, also these non-paradigm humans do not have very strong rights either. So she wants to try and say these could be strong rights like ours, but not these. What's the difference then between the two cases? Well, the first thing she raises as a difference might sort of shock you because it's going to sort of run exactly counter to her arguments with the abortion literature. So she says one difference is potential autonomy. Potential autonomy. So autonomy, the ability for um, self-governance to um, self-direct your life, to be aware of uh, the factors that you're weighing as you make decisions, um, to make rational and moral choices. So the um, infant, right, um, could be one of the non-human, sorry, non-paradigm humans. They are not fully intellectually capable yet. Um, so why is it that they can't be used for, you know, um, food, clothing, medical experiments, yada, yada, yada? Well, if it's an infant, they should have uh, the same strength of rights we have, unlike the animals, because they have potential autonomy. So non-human animals don't have potential autonomy. It's not like if you waited long enough, they would mature and develop into more rational animals. But a little infant, at least, if this is the non-paradigm human that we're talking about, they have potential autonomy. So that potential is a difference maker, which should give them that full strength of rights on par with the, all the adults that have full autonomy already. But notice that that definitely uh, isn't going to be very good for her overall, because in her earlier writings, she's argued that potential autonomy is not a solid basis to ascribe rights to the human fetus. So if abortion is permissible because the fetus is not a person, even though it has the potential to be, then how can she hang her hat on this criteria to distinguish these two cases now? Well, she has your answer. She's ready for that. She says, okay, well, it's not just potential autonomy, but what about the um, born human being that's now no longer a fetus? So we're talking about an infant rather than a, a fetus at any stage of pregnancy. Once they're born, she says, they start rapidly acquiring partial autonomy. So she adds that, not just potential, but partial I find this to be a little bit of a sneaky move, kind of, but here's how she's trying to reason it out. Um, so if you thought potential autonomy was going to just invalidate her whole argument about abortion, she's like, well, never mind that, because something that distinguishes the fetus from the infant is that the fetus doesn't have partial autonomy yet, because they're still enclosed in the womb. So they're not yet having like sensory experiences of all these different types and taking in all that information and developing cognitively from that. But once they're born and they're actually out of the womb, they're gaining all kinds of very, very rapid information from the linguistic environment, from the human environment, from all these inputs that they're taking in from all around. And so you could argue that now they don't just have potential autonomy, like when they were in the womb, but they also have partial autonomy because it's starting to come online as they are already born. Um, well, then what, what, what about one more case? What about if it's neither the fetus or the infant, but rather a cognitively disabled person who hasn't even got partial autonomy or potential autonomy because they're gonna be in this like low cognitive functioning state for their entire life. Um, potential or partial autonomy won't do the trick there. So she has a third line of appeal and that is um, sentimental attachments um, from, from human beings. So sentimental attachments of others. like strong, I should say, like not just sentimental, but like strong sentimental attachments 
emotional attachments, in other words. Okay, so the cognitively disabled um, human being is still going to be a human being that some other humans invest a lot of value in and that they have very powerful emotional ties to. So for that reason, we can say that that's another sort of tiebreaker between them and the non-human animals being compared with them. Now, some uh, non-human animals we may have strong sentimental attachments to, but those are like our pets and so on. And in that case, maybe that does elevate the strength of the rights up a little bit because of that umbrella of vested value that is extended to them from their owners. But, you know, animals living on factory farms that are being raised simply for slaughter or simply for dairy or milk or egg production, um, they're not anybody's pets, and they also don't have partial autonomy or potential autonomy. So it's safe enough, she thinks, to exclude their at least full strength of rights along these bases. Um, and that's how she does this sort of tricky task of trying to simultaneously affirm the strong rights of paradigm humans and non-paradigm humans, but not the strong rights of non-human animals. And the, again, reason to deny their strong rights is because of these cognitive um, deficiencies as compared against mature adult cognitive function. Um, and she's now tried to sort of contort herself into all these positions to, uh, to show that the same argument, which can eliminate the strong rights of non-human animals on an intellectual basis, uh, could somehow be finessed into still allowing non-paradigm humans to have the full strength of rights that we all enjoy, perhaps because they either have potential autonomy. That could be, you know, like a fetus. Partial autonomy, well, that's going to be the infant. Um, maybe this one then drops out because, after all, uh, why should potential autonomy matter um, if it's just a fetus? She already said that was morally permitted, but the fetus doesn't have partial autonomy according to her definition of it anyway because it has to be born to start acquiring that. And if neither of these do the trick because we're dealing with a human that doesn't have the capacity in the future even to develop intellectually, then it at least has this strong sentimental attachment uh, aspect. So... Um, so by analogy to the case of the very young, Warren bases her case for the strong rights of the intellectually disabled. And with that, she concludes that there are, after all, good reasons for granting strong moral rights to humans um, who are non-paradigm humans in various ways. At the very end of her paper, she also considers a couple of miscellaneous objections to animal rights. Um, some people might say that if we believe animals had rights, then that would impose absurd consequences for uh, the natural relationships that animals have with each other. For example, if we think that like a rabbit has a right to life, would that mean that the fox is a murderer or the wolf is a murderer for eating the rabbit? Um, that would of course be an absurd implication of the view that animals have rights. Um, but she says, no, those are not implied by the argument that animals have rights. Um, because first of all, predators in the wild are not moral agents like we are, and so they cannot be making moral determinations about whether what they're doing is right or wrong. And uh, even if they were able to make those moral judgments, what they're killing for the sake of is not for sport or for amusement, but for survival. Um, they're obligate carnivores that do these things, um, and killing for survival would be considered morally permissible, probably even in the human case. The other thing is that animals in the wild that kill each other and eat each other don't keep each other in captivity on factory farms for like the whole duration of their life, making them live this tortured existence until they're summarily slaughtered at the end. So at, at least there's like this kind of humane, uh, quick ending for the animals killed. I mean, it might be brutal as they're being attacked and bit up at the moment of death, but uh, they're not going to endure uh, months and months and years on end of this kind of debilitating treatment either. So anyway, on that point, she says, this is a weak objection to say that if we believe animals had rights, then that would mean that we had to like intervene to stop natural predation. Uh, the analogy doesn't extend there. Animals are not violating each other's rights when they kill and attack each other, because first off, they're not moral agents who make moral choices like us, so they're not burdened with the same moral obligations as we have. Furthermore, they are killing for survival, and they kill on the spot instead of in this kind of extended out way like what humans typically do when we kill and trap animals. Um, Another issue is, does the introduction of rights create all kinds of silly puzzles? So like, 
if we base rights on the level of sentience that a creature has, how strong their rights are, depend on how sentient or aware that they are, how do we measure levels of sentience? So what if I eat like 10 clams? Is that worse or better than eating one chicken? You know what I mean? Because you might say the clam is like, it's not even a vertebrate life form. And so it has a much more primordial ability to perceive things than maybe a, you know, a bird could do. But the numbers matter too, right? So 10 versus one, are we now lost in these abstruse puzzles about relative levels of sentience? To that, Warren says, nice try, but it's also a pretty weak objection because those problems are completely detached from any real world factors that people actually weigh when they make ethical decisions about how to treat animals. Um, and so they're just purely speculative and used to be argumentative, but they're not really relevant to the larger moral um, debate. So in the end, she concludes with this. She says, um, in short, the ascription of moral rights to animals does not have the absurd or environmentally damaging consequences that some philosophers had feared. It does not require us to exterminate predatory species or to lose ourselves in ridiculous speculations about the relative degrees of sentience of different sorts of animals. It merely recognizes us to recognize the interests of animals as having some inherent moral significance, as demanding some consideration, regardless of whether or not human or environmental concerns are also involved. So again, I ask you to think about Warren as a person who's trying to split the difference between animal rights defenders and those that say it's not animals that have got rights. She says, well, let's each have it, our, uh, a, a piece of the pie. Um, we can say they have rights of a similar content where applicable, but even in those cases where they can be applied across animals and non-human animal cases, they are generally going to be of weaker strength because of the lower cognitive awareness they have of the scope and meaning of the right. So a right to life or liberty from a human versus an animal could be just weaker on the animal side because they don't fully understand what it means to lose one's life or to be given private liberty. On the other hand, as this is a cognitively based criterion, relying on the level of awareness or sentience the being has got, you might then start to worry that it has a tendency to exclude from moral concerns some non-paradigm humans like fetuses, infants, or the mentally disabled. And she now makes a point that that can still be distinguished, the non-human animal case, from the non-paradigm human case by pointing out either potential autonomy, although that's problematic towards the abortion argument she's already made before, so she adds partial autonomy, something that would only apply to born humans, and if neither of those apply, as in the case of the mentally disabled, she uh, adds a third criteria that distinguishes the cases of um, intense, powerful, sentimental attachments. On this point about sentimental attachments, I've seen her write about uh, the abortion topic in another area of her writings. And she said that, um, so, you know, some people have accused her of being inconsistent because she says abortion should be morally permissible full stop all the way nine months through pregnancy because um, it's not a person yet. But then once it's born, she doesn't say that it becomes impermissible to kill the infant. So what's the change between the two cases? And she kind of does have that view about the value that human beings invest in the newborn once it's out of the fetus, is, sorry, once it's out of the mother's womb, that valuation from third parties is what gives it this moral standing until such time as it becomes a person through the development of those attributes on its own. So there's kind of like this interregnum period between birth and then the full development of personhood where it's just vested interests given to the thing from members of the moral community that's giving it direct moral standing at that time. And there's an analogy she gave about the Mona Lisa, or at least someone did, where it's like, okay, the Mona Lisa painting sitting up in Paris in the Louvre. Suppose that I try to destroy it, or I do. I set a fire to it, and it's now a pile of ashes. That would be wrong, wouldn't it? But why would it be wrong? It's not wrong because of the harm done to the interests of the Mona Lisa, because the Mona Lisa doesn't have interests. It's a painting, and it therefore can't feel, think, or have any concerns about anything. But it's wrong because why? Because there's so many people in the world who Im ha have intense value that they place on it. There's a lot of attachment uh, toward the Mona Lisa as a classic work of art. So I'd be indirectly doing harm to all those humans that care about it. On par with the analogy, maybe a baby newborn is not yet a person according to Warren's previously stated criteria. Um, but there's value invested in the being until such time as it is. And now that it's outside of the womb, those values cannot come to conflict with the mother's um, interests for bodily autonomy and so on. Uh, but anyway, I talked about that little side sidebar just now only to make one point, which is that uh, the same kind of argument was given her here um, in that debate as to establish the rights or moral standing of newborns. 
um, as was given to show the um, differing status of non-paradigm humans and animals. Okay, <clears throat> so then there's only one more little short piece that I, I just, I know we're getting low on time and I don't want to keep it very much longer, but there was one more author on this whole animal thing and I'm just going to talk to you about him for like just a couple of brief moments. The man's name is Roger Scruton and this is a paper of his from 2007 and it's called The Moral Status of Animals. So I'm just going to give you one quick, a quick last look at an argument. This author is also on the anti-animal side of the debate. He's kind of more like a Kant or a Carl Cohen, the moral status of animals, Roger Scruton, 2007. He's known as a kind of more conservative philosopher on a whole host of other issues too, including this one. And let me just tell you very in brief what he has said. Overall, he says animals don't have rights. Why not? It's kind of back to the Kantian and other authors view about the different uh, intellectual abilities they have. Uh, understanding that a thing has rights means that it also has duties. You don't just get rights, but you also have obligations to not violate other beings' rights. So I have a right to life, but that doesn't just mean nobody can kill me. It also means that I have an obligation to recognize everyone else's right to life and not kill them, etc. Same with the right to property or the right to, you know, um, any other thing. So having rights imposes obligations on you too. But he says animals could not understand the two sides of that um, reciprocity, that they have rights, but also that there are obligations on them to not violate other beings' rights. So a being that cannot understand the, uh, the two roles of having rights and obligations cannot possibly be a holder of rights. And he thinks it would be so ridiculous to say they had rights because then <clears throat> we'd have to do things that we could never do, like get their consent before we took them into captivity or domestic ownership um, or any other case where we put them to human use. Uh, if they have rights, we would also be in the silly position of, he thinks, calling predators immoral uh, for preying on uh, other animals. So he says, after that, let's not say they have rights. Um, <clears throat> we can only relate to other persons in the manner that is appropriate for rights. He thinks that the capacity for suffering is not the only thing that has moral relevance in determining the moral status of another being. And so then at the very end, he moves on to this. He says, if you really want to know what's appropriate or what norms structure the treatment that humans should have toward animals, let's not locate that within a rights-based discussion. But instead, let's just talk about there's three major human to animal types of relationships. So three main human to animal relationships. Okay, so here are the big three. Animals as, what do you think is one of them? We relate to animals. What's one of the relationships that animals stand to humans in? Animals as clearly pets. That's one of them. Some animals are not our pets, though. What are other animals? Well, another case are animals raised for human purposes, like on farms or such like. And then a third relation that we have to animals who are the animals that are not our pets, which are also not on our farms and raised for human cultivation? That's just wild animals, animals in the wild. So Scruton says this. He says, when people talk about what are the rights of the animals or what, what are our obligations to the animals, and it's just stated at that broad level of general talk, like animals. He says that's just too... Um, all-encompassing, we need to make a little more precise delineation of which type of human-to-animal relationship are you referring to, and depending on which one it is, there are norms that structure these three relationships in different ways. So let's go with the pets. This is the one that has the most highly structured set of norms that applies to it. What are the expectations, morally speaking, of how we should treat our pets? Well, with pets, you know, you got to feed and house them, but more than that, care for them, show them some love and um, affection, and um, that kind of warm, loving bond between owner and pet is the norm and the expectation of pet ownership. Um, of course, why is that reasonable? Because if you have taken in a pet, you have caused that animal to depend on you for everything in life, for food, for affection, and for, you know, just the daily needs that it has. So by making it dependent on you, it only makes sense for you to carry forward those obligations that you brought about on yourself by choosing to take a pet. If you hadn't wanted to have those obligations, you didn't need to bring in a pet. But since you did, 
now it seems like it's only fair for, to, for us to expect that you care, love, and nurture it throughout its whole natural life. On the other hand, though, what about animals that are raised just for farm factory or other agricultural purposes, like dairy cows or uh, beef cattle or you know uh, hens that lay chickens and stuff, or pigs that are being used for pork and other animal uh, products? Um, well, what are they? What's the norms that structure our relation to them? Do they expect us to take them on a walk or to play fetch or something? No, uh, we're just kind of custodians of them. They see us as just um, like their daily source of sustenance until such time as they're used for whatever human purpose or what have you and might end their life. But, you know, throughout their entire life, there's no common expectation, even on the animals we have, that we would play for with them, that we would, um, you know, baby talk to them or to try and pet them and stuff. So we're just like aspects of the environment to these farm animals. And therefore, the norms that structure this type of relationship are not the same that structure our relations to pets. If you just threw out like, um, a trough of food for your pets and, uh, you know, monitor them like once a day, um, you'd probably be a deficient pet owner, but that would not necessarily be improper if it was a farm animal pig. And that's a different type of human animal relationship. What about the third? Well, now there's almost no interaction uh, that is some somehow within a structured norm. Uh, you certainly don't want to play fetch or try to pet these guys, nor do you want to even uh, try and provide them with minimal needs. Uh, because they're wild animals and they're dangerous. So your best bet is to leave them alone or maybe at least preserve the habitats that are necessary for them to continue to at least survive and not go extinct. But notice that this imposes even fewer um, structured obligations than this case does, where there's at least some kind of expectation of upkeep and maintenance uh, for the term period that they're until they're needed by a human for some other reason. So what he says at the end is, um, let's not talk about what we owe the animals. Let's talk about what we owe the animals who are animals as one of these three relations. And then we'll get a possibly different answer, which he thinks is fully justified because in the first place they don't have rights, but whatever um, morally appropriate or normal treatment that is right to do uh, can't be specified without reference to the specific type of relationship we're standing in. Them. So as he says it himself here, he says, firstly, we relate to animals in three distinct situations, which define three distinct kinds of responsibility as pets, as domestic animals raised for human purposes, and as wild creatures. Secondly, the situation of animals is radically and often irreversibly changed as soon as human beings take an interest in them. Pets and other domestic animals are usually entirely dependent on human care for their survival and well-being, and wild animals too are needed sometimes to depend on human measures to protect their food supplies and habitat. I cannot count the interests of my dog as on par with the interests of other dog, wild or domesticated, even though they have an equal capacity for suffering and an equal need for pain. My dog has a special claim on me, not wholly dissimilar from the claim of my child. I caused it to be dependent on me, precisely by leading it to expect that I would cater for its needs. The situation is farther complicated by the distinction between species. Um, dogs may form lifelong attachments, and a dog brought up by one person may be incapable of living comfortably with another. A horse, though, may be bought or sold many times with little or no distress, provided it is properly cared for by each of its owners. Sheep maintained in flocks are every bit as dependent on human care as dogs and horses but they don't notice it and regard their shepherds as guardians as little more than aspects of the environment, which rise like the sun in the morning and depart like the sun at night. For these reasons, we must consider our duties towards animals in three separate ways, as pets, as animals raised for our purposes, and as creatures of the wild. So just another interesting kind of nuanced take on the debate, even though it tends towards the more anti-animal Kantian style position, he's willing to grant uh, a little room for discussion on, you know, uh, the norms that may pertain differently to the three types of human animal relationships with the specific attention to the more structured and expected norms that relate to the first type here. So guys, thanks so much for all your uh, time today. I'm happy that you're able to watch this lesson. Um, we only have a couple more, so please don't try to uh, fade at the end here. We want to go strong to the finish line, but I'll be in touch with you soon on the next couple of les lessons that I'll post. For now, have a great one. Take care, and as always, uh, stay safe. I'll see you guys soon. Thank you.